So we've got Lisa Doherty with us again today for uh, 10 Essential Websites for Irish Genealogy. Thank you for joining us today. If you have questions during this presentation, you can type them into the chat or the Q&A and Lisa will address them um, when it's a good time to do so. Uh, we will not be having a presentation in August. The next one will be on Monday, September 13th at noon, and that will be an introduction to ancestry family trees. So uh, look for the sign up for that in our library calendar uh, mid-August or so. And let's see, what else did I wanna say about this? I think that's about all I had to say. So I will uh, hand it over to Lisa. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming today. And we're gonna to talk today about essential websites for Irish genealogy. Um, the good news about Irish genealogy, and sometimes people believe there's not really a lot of good news about Irish genealogy because it can be fairly difficult. But the good news is that most of the basic records that you need for doing or working on your Irish family history can be found online. And this is, um, this is something that has been done purposely uh, because Irish genealogy research has such a reputation for being difficult and for the fact that there's not as many records maybe for Irish ancestors as there might be for ancestors with other ethnicities. Um, the Irish government has made an effort to put a lot of their records online to help people in their search for family. Um, this is because when we work with Irish records, we have to work with lots of different types of records because some of the basic records that we're used to, say, for working on ancestors in the United States, like 19th century census records or sometimes vital records, some of those things are not uh, part of the, what we can find for going forward with Irish ancestry. Um, but the good news is that a lot of these basic records are available online. So things that even 10 years ago you couldn't do online, you had to go to Ireland to do research, you can now sit in your home and research online. And we're gonna talk about some of those websites today. Um, there's a little bit more than 10 because I've kind of categorized them a little bit. So different categories of websites I've put together. And some of these websites are free and some of them are not free. So I have made it very clear which ones are which when we go through. So you can make the decision whether it's worth it to you to pay for the information that's available on that website or if you want to work around it or do it a little differently. Totally up to you. Okay, so we're going to start with basics. And when we talk about Irish genealogy, it's really a good idea to start with the basics. I think in the minds of a lot of people, and especially those that don't have a lot of experience with researching Irish ancestors, the thought is when they find that they have an ancestor that was born in Ireland, they become very excited and they think, wow, this is awesome. I really want to find out where in Ireland so I can go there and take a trip. And I think a lot of people make the mistake that when they find out that their great grandfather, Patrick Murphy, was born in Ireland, they think, oh, now I can go to Ireland and find his birth record. Well, those of you have, who have been doing this for a while understand that if there's one Patrick Murphy born in 1850, there's a thousand other Patrick Murphys born in 1850. So the point is, is that you really need to do your research in your ancestors adopted home country before you start looking in Ireland. Because if you can't find it in an American record, you're not going to find it in an Irish record. So what you need to do is do as much background information research as you can about your ancestor from basic records that you can find for places in the United States, like census records or vital records, which are records of birth, marriage, and death, or citizenship records like naturalization records, or newspaper articles, um, church records, all of these types of records that you can find for your ancestor after they come to the United States can be very helpful in your search for that ancestor in Ireland. Um, a lot of times we need to gather the information, anything that refers to an exact place, which can sometimes be very rare, to information about your ancestors, parents, siblings, relatives, any kind of extra information that you can find about your ancestor is going to be very helpful 
when you start looking at Irish records. And of course, a couple of the websites that we use for basic records are Family Search, which is free, and Ancestry, which you do have to pay for if you want to access from home. However, a lot of our public libraries, because of COVID, have been offering access to Ancestry through their library's website. So if you have a Clifton Park Library card, you can access Ancestry.com through the Clifton Park Library website. If the Clifton Park Library is not your library, you can check with your local library to see if they are offering access to Ancestry through their website. Um, this is something that's happening quite often. I've seen quite a few announcements of libraries that are offering Ancestry remotely through the end of this year. So check with your local library to see if this is something that they're doing. Um, the, the importance of basic records really can't be overstated. Um, you really do need to learn as much as you can about your ancestor in the United States. And I know like sometimes people will say, well, why do I need another census record? I know about when he was born and I know where he lived in the United States. So why do I need that? Well, sometimes what happens is the census record that you decide to skip over is the one that contains a vital clue, such as maybe your ancestor had a sister or brother living with them. Maybe your ancestor had a parent living with them, and maybe that parent passed away before the next census. So all of those kinds of clues can be very important to your search. So don't skip over basic records when you're doing research on your Irish ancestor. And of course, in the United States, one of the advantages we have is that there's a lot of, we have a lot of good access to records, and there's a lot, also a very wide variety of records. Um, it's easy to learn about what records are available. Um, any kind of tutorials on Ancestry or on FamilySearch can help you with that. Um, you also want to keep track of your information as you get it. So as you're getting your information, you want to keep track of it in some way so that you don't research the same thing several times or so that you can create a timeline for your ancestor and you can know the timetable of where he was when. And that becomes especially important with these people that have such common names. So you know that your Patrick Murphy, who was living in 1870 in Troy, New York, and had children born from 1860 to 1870 in New York State, can't possibly be the same Patrick Murphy that lives in Minnesota in 1865. So you see what I mean about having um, a timeline to put your ancestor in a specific place at a specific time. Very important, especially with these ancestors that have such common names. So I like this quote from John Grenham. And if any of you have done Irish genealogy research, you will recognize the name of John Grenham. He is probably one of the best known Irish genealogists that is working today. He has um, a YouTube channel, he has a website, he has a blog that he posts re pretty regularly on. Um, this is a quote from one of his blogs. And he just says, in sum, one of the biggest obstacles to successful research in Irish records is the lack of appreciation of the extraordinary variation in the written records of Irish surnames. They are unimaginably slippery. And I put this in here to make us all aware of the fact that when we are doing our research, um, it doesn't matter with what, what um, ancestor we're, we're working on. It doesn't matter what ethnicity that ancestor is. We're going to encounter variations in the written record of spellings of our ancestors' names. And this goes for both first names and last names. So you wanna keep a very open mind when you're looking at records. It's very likely that no matter how your ancestor's name is spelled here in the United States, it's extremely likely that you are going to run into some kind of spelling, spelling variation when you get to Irish records. As a matter of fact, it's almost a guarantee. And you know we know the reasons behind this. It has to do with who was doing the recording. It has to do with people's accents. It has to do with a lot of different factors. But it's definitely something that you need to be aware of um, when you're looking at any records that it has to do with your ancestor. Don't discount a record based on spelling alone. Um, you may use spelling sort of as a criteria, but don't say this can't be my ancestor because they spell their name with an A and we spell ours with an E. So certainly do not discount records because of that. 
look at the other parts of the record to see if they make sense. Time period, people's names, places, all of those things count for important factors when we're looking at a record and evaluating it. All right, so moving on to more websites. Second website that we're gonna talk about is Irish Genealogy Toolkit. Now this is a kind of a how-to website. You're not going to find records on here on this website. You're going to find instead information about records and information about researching information about places. So it's basically a general a general website for information about a lot of things having to do with genealogy. Um, Irish Genealogy Toolkit is the name of the website and Irish Genealogy News is the name of a blog and they are both the responsibility of a woman named Claire Santry. And Claire Santry is in Ireland. She's an experienced family historian she started this website to be able to educate people about records and about different types of research that people can do in Irish records. So if you have a question about what is something or where can I find something, this is the place to go to look. So say you've heard of Griffith's valuation, but you don't really know what it is, you will find an explanation about Griffith's valuation on the Irish Genealogy Toolkit website. Um, Claire's blog is updated fairly regularly. One thing she's very good at pointing out is when there are new records that come online, she's very good about reporting where the new records are located and how you can ask, access them. She's also very good about letting people know when certain websites are going to be down and they can't be accessed for updates or that kind of thing. So she's very good at keeping people in the loop as far as what goes on with Irish genealogy. So it's well worth looking at her blog fairly regularly because you will get news that's pretty up to date about what's going on in the world of Irish genealogy. So it is a great website for learning about different things um, and also for keeping up with the latest as far as online Irish genealogy goes. So it's a really excellent website for those things. So speaking of John Grenham, we're going to talk about him a little bit here. He is the author of this book that you see on the screen called Tracing Your Irish Ancestors. It's been in several editions. It's probably even been updated since this picture came out. Um, but this is sort of the thing that John Grenham is best known for, this um, edition of Tracing Your Irish Ancestors, which gives you lots of very detailed information about what records are available for what localities. So if you have an ancestor that you do know where they come from in Ireland, you can use this book to find out what records you can expect to find from that area. So it covers things like church records of all denominations. It covers land records. It covers um, directories, maps, all kinds of things that can be useful in the tracing of an Irish ancestor. The book is certainly worth it to purchase. You can get that on Amazon. Um, probably some of the local libraries also have it, but the companion website is called um, Irish Ancestors and it's under, used to be under the Irish Times, um, but it is a, a good website, contains all of the information that's in the book, and any of the information about the resources can be accessed for no extra cost, so it's free. Um, what isn't going to be free are detailed reports about certain places, um, he has something on the website where you can put an Irish surname in and he will show you on a map where all of the families with that surname lived in the mid 19th century. So that's a really great tool. I use that a lot for if I have an unusual surname that I'm working on. It doesn't work so well for the for the um, popular ones like it doesn't work so well for names like Walsh, which is my surname. They're everywhere all over Ireland. So that isn't really going to help you. But with more rare surnames, um, it definitely will help you to pinpoint an area where, where they could be from. So that can be very helpful. Um, I was just working on um, a, a family and the last name was Hoy, H-O-Y. And I was able to use the uh, surname finder to find areas where these people would likely be from in Ireland. So that's a very useful tool. That's going to cost you a little bit to, to use, but the maps 
and the information pages about the records, those are free. So you can use them at any time. Um, this is just a sampling of what of the things, of some of the things on the website that, as I mentioned, the surname distribution maps. Also, um, there's a lot of listings of surname variations. So we talked about the spelling and the variations. So this is also a good place to look up those surname variations. Um, the maps showing the civil and Catholic parishes for each county, again, very useful. Um, it is the most complete listing of what records are available from where. So um, John Grenham not only details online sources, he also details offline sources. So that's a very valuable tool. And then of course, um, he has a blog that he offers his views on current Irish genealogy topics and they're, and they're very interesting to read. So that's, that's a little bit about what can be found on John Grenham's website. Okay, so the next set of websites are gonna be websites about place locators and maps. Now, one of the more challenging aspects of, of working on your Irish family really has to do with locating places. So sometimes you can be very lucky and you can get a indication of a place name from a source in the United States, like maybe your ancestor's gravestone has the name of a place on it, or maybe your ancestor's naturalization record gives a town of birth or maybe a death record. Um, the problem with these records is it's wonderful to have a specific place notification. However, spelling is rarely standardized. And so sometimes it becomes a real hunt to try to identify what place this is and how we can identify where it is. So fortunately, there are a number of tools online that can help us to do that. Um, some are used in conjunction with maps. Some use uh, letters to just a few letters to be able to figure something out. Um, one thing that I want to point out is this website um, by Shane Wilson called uh, swilson.info. This website is extremely valuable in helping you to find out place names. Now, I've what I've done up here is this is called a Townland database. So what you can do is you can put a name or a partial name of a townland into the box on the left. You can choose a county if you know what county it's in. And you can choose what search type you want to do. You can only add a few letters. You have to add, add at least three letters of the, of the name of the town. And you can either say it starts with these letters, it ends with these letters, these, these letters are in the middle of it somewhere. You can make any of those choices. You can choose a county or not. If you know the PLU or the barony or the civil parish, you can put that in. But when you search, and you can see I've put the letters BOR in the search box, and I'm gonna say I wanna find all town lands in Queens County that begin with BOR. So I've done that and the results of the search are below. Then I can go through and I can say, well, does this look like the town land that's written on the death certificate for my great, great grandfather? Is this as close as it, it comes? Because we know how horrible the handwriting can be on those things sometimes. So it sort of becomes, a, okay, this name makes sense or this location makes sense. But what this does is it gives you the name of the townland, it gives you how many acres are in the townland, and it also gives you the civil parish, the barony, the, and the PLU, which are very important for looking at Irish records down the road, especially the civil parish. If you're going to be looking at Griffith's valuation records, you will need to know the civil parish. If you're going to be looking at Catholic parish records, that's a whole other ballgame. So those are just very important things that you need. SWilson.info also has a converter that allows you to convert your civil parish into a Roman Catholic parish. That's another page on SWilson.info. So that's absolutely invaluable for doing locations. And it is not ever easy. I can tell you that it can be very difficult. Um, little in the little info blurb on the bottom just tells you a little bit about what you can find at the swilson.info site. So it's definitely worth your look. And if you are trying to figure out place names, it's a great resource and it's a wonderful place to look. 
Um, the other thing that sometimes we have problems with when we find a place name, we don't know what it is. So if we say we find a place name in the United States and we see the we see Troy, New York. Well, if we're familiar with New York, we know that Troy is in Rensselaer County and that's in New York. So we know those things off the top of our head. Unfortunately, when it comes to Irish place names, most of us don't have that kind of familiarity. So what we need to first do is determine what is this place name? Is it a barony? Is it a parish? Is it a townland? If it's a parish, is it a civil parish? Is it a Catholic parish? We just don't know. So we have to sort of make some sort of determination. And that's what a lot of these search engines will allow us to do. They will allow us to figure out what exactly is the place name that we're interested in and looking at. These websites will make an attempt to standardize spelling, but the spelling is only going to be standardized within the website. So you may be seeing a spelling on swilson.info that may be a different spelling from one of the other websites. Again, there is really no standardization, even up to this day, it, the spelling still very, very greatly. Um, a lot of these websites will provide information on where exactly the place it is. So if you're looking for a place called um, Ballygowan, you know it's by looking at a map, you know it's the Bally Gallum in County Galway and not the one in County Wicklow. So that's just an example. And these, these websites, a lot of them have both modern and historic maps. So you can see the place where your ancestor lived in a historic context, but also in a modern context. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay, so an, a free website that you should be aware of is called Irish Genealogy. Now, this is a website that has been put forth by the Irish government, and it contains some very useful records. Now, one of the things that it contains for that is for use for everyone generally is the Irish civil registration records. So the civil registration is the registration of births, marriages, and deaths. It covers the entire country. It covers the entire island of Ireland. So it also covers the North. It just does not just cover the South. It covers the North up till 1922, which is good because that's pretty much where you're gonna be cut off as far as um, being able to access these records. So anything before 1922 can be accessed on this website. Um, the other thing that should be mentioned is that civil records began to be recorded in Ireland in 1864. So it's earlier than in New York state, but later than a lot of us really need because mo a lot of our ancestors may have already left Ireland by 1864. So it may not be of use for our direct ancestors, but there's a very good possibility that your ancestor even coming to the United States may have left relatives behind in Ireland who stayed there. So it can be useful from that point of view. Um, it also has some church records. Um, this is one of the strange things about Irish genealogy is that some things are available on some websites and other things are available on other websites. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, if you are researching Irish ancestors and you use these records a lot, then you will get used to it and you will get used to knowing where is what. So it won't be confusing any longer. Um, but basically this is sort of the synopsis for what's available for free on irishgenealogy.ie. If you have ancestors from Cary or West or Northwest Cork, which is the area that borders County Cary and Dublin City, Roman Catholic, then any of the, this website's going to be for you. Um, those records won't be available anywhere else. Also some Church of Ireland records here, and I just noticed that Carlo is spelled incorrect, so I gotta go fix that. Um, but those records for Church of Ireland are available on the website. And as I mentioned, the civil registration. The civil registration, it says 1845 to 1965. The indexes are available for those years. 1845 was when registration of Protestant marriages began. So from 1845 to 1864, we have records for 
Protestant marriages. We don't have Roman Catholic ones. Those start in 1864. So if your ancestors are Roman Catholic, you will not get any kinds of records about them before 1864, unless they married in a Church of Ireland church, which is totally something that could have happened. Um, you not only have the indexes, but you also have the actual records for most of these years. You just have to check with the website to see exactly what's there. So there are the actual images of the records on the website and it's, it's incredibly helpful. All right, so with more records, we can use rootsireland.ie. This is a pay website. So you do have to pay for access. You do not get any images of, of records on this website. All you are going to get is a transcription. The source of the records on the Roots Ireland website are the records of the county heritage centers. So in the 1980s, the late 1980s, the Irish counties each set up a heritage center meant to help people with locating their Irish ancestors. And back in the day, they had a mail-in service where you could fill out a form and you could mail in your form and your check and they would do research in their databases for you. When they were set up, when the county heritage centers were set up, they set up computer databases based on local records. So local people went into the local parish records and they transcribed the local parish records and they put them in a database, which each county heritage center has. So the source of this information differs slightly from the source of other information that we're gonna talk about shortly. This is a pretty complete collection for most of the country of Ireland. There are some exceptions. Some um, parishes did not cooperate and did not submit their records. So it's going to come down to knowing exactly which parish you are dealing with. So again, you're going to be seeing things on this website that are transcriptions. They are not going to be images, only transcriptions. Um, you can use the database as an index to online Catholic parish records from the National Library. We're gonna talk about the National Library website in a little bit. Um, you can use this as a kind of an index to find people. Say if you don't know the parish that your ancestor lived in, you can look them up on the, this Roots Ireland website find where their marriage or their baptism was, and then go to the free National Library of Ireland website and find the, the actual image of the record. So it's a little bit of a confusing process, but the more you use these resources, the better you're going to get at using them. Um, you can buy a subscription to access the database. You can buy it monthly. I think you can even buy it weekly or you can buy it yearly. And of course you're going to get the biggest savings if you buy it yearly. Occasionally they have sales. I think they were just having a 20% off sale. Um, that might be something to check into, uh, but they, they are subscription based. So if it's something you think you're going to use, then you can certainly go ahead and use it. I have to say I use it quite often. So I do feel it's worth the money. So we were talking just a second ago about the National Library of Ireland. In 2015, the National Library of Ireland scanned and uploaded their entire collection of Roman Catholic parish records. So since July of 2015, this, care, this collection has been available online. The National Library collection does not include a search engine. So to use the collection at the National Library website, you have to search by parish. So you do need to know the parish's name, where your ancestor came from before you can search this effectively. So this is what I was referring to on the Roots Ireland website, using the Roots Ireland website as a kind of index to be able to find out what the parish name is. So once you know the parish name, you can put the parish name into this little box and you can search for it and it will come up with all of the records that the National Library has for that parish. So um, you do need to know. And then once you do get to the parish that you're interested in, then you have to search through page by page. There is again, no place for you to put in an ancestor's name. 
you just have to search page by page. The good news is that when you are looking at a page in the upper left hand corner, it will tell you what month and year you're looking at. So you don't have to go searching for that every time you look at a page. So it is a little bit helpful to be able to do that. It's not complete blind searching. Um, but sometimes I find that searching page by page gives you a lot of benefit. Aside from the obvious eye strain and headaches you get from reading the writing, um, it gives you an, an opportunity to see ancestors records in context. So for example, here's, a, here's an example of a record from um, the, a typical um, record entry. And this one happens to be an 1836 marriage record. And you can tell that it's sort of all over the place and the writing's bigger and it's smaller and it's squished in and there's a lot of problems with it. But there's one thing that's very important about this record is it's probably an original record. So if you see this kind of varied handwriting and different, you know, different spacing, it looks way too messy to be something that someone copied over from another book. So this is very likely an original record. But that being said, there is a lot of um, there's a lot of things that we have to consider when we're looking at written records. We have to be able to read the writing. Um, we have to be able to discern uh, abbreviations. Sometimes we have to be familiar with Latin terms because priests would sometimes write things in Latin. Um, they don't always. They tend to do a lot of abbreviating. So um, those are things that we have to watch out for. So this is, a, this is an interesting example. They're not all this messy. Some are more neat. Um, others are worse messy. So it just depends on the parish and the time period as well. But this is what you can expect to see. Okay, so now to talk a little bit about Griffith's valuation. So Griffith's valuation, if you're not aware of it, is a set of basically taxation records. And because Ireland does not have census records that it survived for the 19th century with few exceptions, there are a few exceptions, but not many, um, Griffith's valuation has taken on a great deal of importance because it's about the only thing that can tell you where in Ireland your ancestor lived in the mid 19, 19th century. So we're talking 1840s, 1850s, sometimes 1860s. So Griffith's valuation can be incredibly valuable. That being said, if you have an ancestor with a very common name and you don't know where they came from, this is not going to be a very useful tool for you. You've got to know where your ancestor came from, especially if they have a very common name. Um, the the website that we that I use most often to access Griffith's valuation is called Ask About Ireland, and that's that's here. Ask About Ireland is a small section of a larger website that comes from some of the, the libraries, the library network in Ireland. So they have other things like scanned books and lots of basic information about places. Um, but this is really the goldmine of the website. You can get Ask About or you can get Griffith's Valuation at other websites. But I happen to like this one because it gives me the most information. So you can search up for your ancestor by name through Griffith's, Griffith's Valuation, or you can search for a particular townland and just look and see who lived in that townland. That's another option. Um, one thing that it does is when you do find your ancestor, you can pinpoint exactly where they lived on one of these older maps. And then from that exact location on the older map, you can toggle the map over to a modern Google map. So if you are going to Ireland and you want to go and see exactly where your ancestor lived, you can pretty much pinpoint exactly where their plot of land was using these old maps and then toggling into the more modern maps. And I've actually done this before. I've gone to Ireland with this information and I've had people take me to these exact places and it's, it's a wonderful experience. So this website makes that all possible. But the hurdles we have to get over first before we can make a determination is we've got to know exactly where our ancestor came from. And it also has to be an ancestor that was alive during the time when Griffiths was taken and the head of a household at the time when Griffiths was taken. So if your ancestor came over here as a child 
they're probably not going to qualify for having a listing in Griffiths, but maybe their father would. So you do need to know the name of the ancestor who was living at the time of Griffiths. And it is only going to tell you the head of the household. So it's not going to tell you that Patrick Murphy was married to Mary Sullivan. It's only going to tell you that Patrick Murphy lived in this certain place. So you really have got to do your homework first and know where your ancestor came from. And sometimes we do a little bit of back and forth kind of things like, well, this could be him, but this maybe not be him. So there's a lot of digging that needs to be done. Um, the the real strength of this website and using Griffiths Valuation here is absolutely the maps because it gives you a good sense of how much land your ancestor was occupying, what kinds of things they were doing as far as farming goes, um, what the terrain was like, was it hilly, was it rocky, that sort of thing. It also um, lets you know a little bit about what types of buildings were on that holding. So it will sell, say things like, it had a house, it had offices, which is what um, outbuildings are described as, outbuildings such as barns and sheep pens and chicken coops and things like that, they are described as, as offices. So you will know what types of, of things your ancestor had on his, his property that he was occupying. In most cases, ancestors did not own the property that they lived on. Those, those were owned by landlords. Sometimes you will see the landlord name listed next to your ancestor's name. Um, at the very least, the person listed next to your ancestors would be the one that they were paying their rent to. So whether it would be the actual owner of the property or someone who was a middleman. But it does give you quite a bit of information about the areas where your ancestor was living. So this is absolutely something that's worth looking into. All right, so another great website for Irish genealogy is Find My Past. A lot of people in the United States have not heard of Find My Past. It is a UK website, so it's much better known. It's sort of like the UK ancestry in a way. They have a heavy concentration on British Isles records, but they also have a lot on Ireland. They have a lot of unique record sets for Ireland that you can't find anywhere else. Um, oftentimes I'll just go in to find my past and I'll put uh, my ancestor's name in and see what comes up and hope that there's something interesting in there. Um, some of the things that they have, um, which is really very useful, is the Petty Sessions records I think are great. They're basically court records which detail all kinds of petty crimes. So they're exactly what they say, petty. You can get everything from livestock straying onto other people's lands, to people cutting fences, to drunken fights, all kinds of these little sort of insignificant crimes. Um, it's very, I, I almost always will find an ancestor in those records. Um, and again, it comes down to being able to identify the name of the ancestor and the location that they lived in. So that, that's the most important. There are some landed estate records where you may be able to find your ancestor listed as a tenant on one of these big estates. I use the newspapers database quite often because you can find information about your ancestor sometimes in the Irish newspapers. You can also get Griffiths maps and the Griffiths valuation on this website. Um, it is a pay website. They do occasionally offer free weekends. So if you, um, sign up for their, if you are following their Facebook page, they will allow people, they'll let people know when they have free, free weekends, which is great. Another thing that's a really great resource on this website, if you have ancestors in um, New York City, is the Manhattan area diocese ca Roman Catholic records are available on, um, on Find My Past. So um, churches from Manhattan, um, are available. You can find some for Westchester County, some for Ulster County, some for Dutchess County. Uh, very, very good resource for those records. Some have images attached to them, others do not, but it is a wonderful way of finding some of those Roman Catholic um, ancestors that lived in, in New York City. So that's, that's a really great resource. Um, here's an example from the Petty Sessions records. And 
I am, I just had my eyes dilated this morning, so I can't read what it says, but it's an example of those kind of petty crimes that were brought into the courts. And it will tell you who's involved in the case, who is the accuser, who's the accused, what was the crime, when it occurred, where it occurred, and what was the result of the little trial that they had. Usually it amounts to fines. Sometimes you'll find that people will be jailed for things. Uh, but it's very interesting because it, it offers a, an insight into what life was like um, back in 1854. So it's really very interesting. All right, so another free resource, which is great, is the National Archives of Ireland. So this is different from the National Library. This is the actual archives. A couple of things that I use the archives website for. Um, we just got done talking about Griffith's valuation. There is an earlier set of land records. They're called the tithe allotment books. Those date from the 1820s. Um, those are available on this National Archives of Ireland website and they're, they're free and you can search them. They're not as detailed as Griffith's. There's a whole bunch of people that are excluded from the tithe. Basically, if you lived in a city or a town, you probably aren't going to make it into the tithe because you had to have one acre of land or more. So if your ancestor was farming, there's a, a good possibility you may be able to find them in the tithe. If your ancestor was a blacksmith in a village, you probably will not find them in the tithe. But again, it's a set of names and locations. It isn't going to tell you very much about the ancestor. It's just going to tell you that that's where they lived, but it can be very useful. Um, the other thing that I use this website for is the 1901 and 1911 census records. So um, as many people know, Irish census records were greatly destroyed for the 19th century. Some of them were destroyed on purpose, others were accidentally destroyed, but the bottom line is there really is very little remaining of any of the censuses for the 19th century. The earliest complete census for the entire country is 1901, and we also have access to the 1911 census. Um, there was not a census taken in 1921 because that was a lot of civil war going on at that time. The next census was taken in 1926. There has been some talk of getting that released early um, because there's a hundred year privacy law. But at this point, it's looking like it's probably going to be 2026 before it finally gets released. So the 1901 and 1911 censuses can be very useful. I know at first when they came out, I thought, well, you know, all my ancestors were gone by then. What use are they to me? But I was able to find um, my great, great grandmother's brother still living in Ireland in the 1901 census. And that was very instrumental in finding out a lot of information about his descendants. So these are really good records to see if there are still people of the same name living in the place where your ancestor came from, because you can guess that they can definitely be relatives if they have the same name. The other thing I like about these records is they tell you the county of birth of the person, and they also tell you whether this person spoke Irish or English or both. So that's very, very good information and also very interesting information. Um, and here's a, an example of what the tithe allotment books look like. They're very basic. They just have the names of the land occupiers and they have the name of the town where they lived and they have the amount of acreage and then the amount of useful acreage. So just because you had 34 acres didn't mean all 34 were usable. Um, the, so again, the tithe, the name refers to a tax payable to the Church of Ireland. So you can imagine this was not a very popular type of thing going on at this time. Um, there were people that were called tithe dissenters, which meant they didn't, they refused to pay. And so their name went on a, on a list and that list can be accessed, I believe on Find My Past. So if you had an ancestor that was a troublemaker, you may be able to find them there. All right, Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. For those of you that have Northern Ireland ancestors, you are going to find a bunch of overlap with records that come from the Republic. Generally in repositories that are in the Republic, like the National Library, like the National Archives, 
you will find some Northern Ireland content. Generally, in Northern Ireland office, you're not going to find Republic content. So it works one way, but it doesn't work the other way. So for example, at PRONI, which is the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, you're not going to find records for the Republic. It is going to be limited to the six counties of Northern Ireland. And those counties are Derry, uh, Armagh, Antrim, Down, Monaghan, and Fermanagh. So those are the six counties of Northern Ireland. Um, PRONI has a variety of good records that are unique to Northern Ireland. And one of the great things that PRONI has are the valuation revision books. So we talked about Griffith's valuation. Griffith's valuation was the land survey that was taken mid-century. Well, Griffith's valuation was updated. About every 10 years, people would come in and they would survey the land and they would say, okay, is this person still living there or are they gone and is somebody else taking it over? And they would go into these books and they would cross out the person who left and write the name in of the person who was occupying the property then. So these books continued into the 20th century. They are available for the Republic at the Valuation Office in Dublin. They are available for Northern Ireland on the Crony website. So if you have an ancestor that lived in Northern Ireland, you can research him from Griffith's Valuation up until about the 1920s, 1930s. So that can be extremely helpful. I'm just waiting for the day when the valuation books for the Republic become available online. I know that's something that's being worked on. But PRONI is a wonderful resource for that thing alone, but there's lots of other things. So there are things here, examples, um, will calendars, if, you have, if your ancestor lived and died in Northern Ireland and had a will, you will be able to find information about that document. Um, I mentioned the valuation revision books, signers of the Ulster Covenant, street directories for Belfast can be very useful if your ancestor lived there. There is a collection of archive presentations from PRONI on YouTube. There is also a photograph collection that PRONI has that gives you lots of photographs from around Northern Ireland. So lots of really good resources from PRONI. Okay. I've talked a lot. So let's see if we have any questions um, for me. I, I've been looking at the chat thing. I've been looking at the questions, haven't seen anything. If anybody's got any questions, please feel free to type them in and I'll be glad to answer them for you. There's a lot of information here. While we wait for any questions that might come in, I just want to remind everybody that there won't be a presentation in August. Our next presentation will be on Monday, September 13th, and that will be an introduction to Ancestry Family Trees. This presentation is being recorded, so if you felt like it was a lot of information and you'd like to go back and revisit it, uh, that recording will be available on the library's YouTube channel sometime within the next few days. Our staff here usually gets it put up pretty quickly. So I will send around an email with a link to this presentation once it's available on YouTube. Great. So if you have a question that you think about later on, um, feel free to send me an email. I'll be glad to answer it for you. Um, also, I do have one um, appointment available for August 5th. That's at the Clifton Park Library in person. And it is, I'm remembering now, it is at 1230. So um, if you want to come in at 1230 and chat with me, you will certainly are welcome to. Okay, what is the best way to research ancestors who emigrated during the famine? Okay, again, you're going to want to find as much information about that ancestor as you can in the United States. So that means collecting all kinds of documents about that ancestor. It's going to mean census records. It's going to mean um, bur uh, marriage or death record of, the, of that ancestor. It's going to mean any kinds of birth or baptism records for that ancestor's children. Also assembling information about your ancestor's spouse. That's also important. Um, basically any and all types of information you can get a hold of in regard to your ancestor. Also pay close attention to any family members your ancestor may have had. Because if your ancestor died in, say, 1860 and doesn't have a death record, your ancestor may have a brother or sister who survived till 1900, and they will have a death record. And that death record would have the parents' names on it. 
So that's a very important piece of information to keep a hold of. So it's basically gathering as many documents as you can about your ancestor in this country before you start looking in Ireland. So that's the very important first step. Okay, so in the chat, thank you. And I'm really happy to have done this. Again, if you guys have any more questions, if you wanna know anything, just shoot me an email and I'll be very happy to help you with whatever information you need. So thank you very much. And uh, we will see you in September. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all, all right. for joining us. Bye-bye.